Welcome to our program on immigration and legal affairs. I am your immigration attorney, Michael Fulwani, and once again, we have with us attorney David Nachman. David, thank Namaste. you. And as we <laughs> probably you might have seen the last program, and we advised you that uh, both David and me, we just came back from India, and in India we had meetings with the American consular officials in the American consulate in Chennai, in the American embassy in New Delhi, and then in Mumbai, India. And a lot of information that we gave you last time on how the interviews are conducted by the consular post, especially on the 214B related cases, where the consular office has more discretion to deny just based upon his own feeling as to whether the person will come back or not. And in that connection, a lot of people have this question. My father, I am a citizen. My father applied for a visitor visa, they denied him. And the argument is that if he's a citizen, he can get a green card for the father any time within a year. So what's a big deal? I mean, he, he says, I don't want to immigrate, give me a visitor visa, but doesn't happen. And in many other cases, the question is raised about the intent of the person, whether the person has an immigrant intent or he's a bona fide non-immigrant. Now, I tell you an interesting thing. One of the officers we met, uh, David and me, he said that we are very sympathetic. Sometimes he says, I feel so bad in denying. Uh, I see a real genuine case that a person really, really has to go to see the children, see the brother or the family, a function, maybe a marriage, maybe somebody is sick, maybe the granddaughter, granddaughter grandson's graduation party. He believes that. Yeah. He, but, but the point here, he says that I have to follow the law. When I'm asking him questions, he's not able to answer properly. So that, that raises the issue whether this person has overcome the burden of satisfying to the council. And he, the council that, I mean, some council like him are like following the textbook. He says, we have the, we have the law here. I have this textbook which says this is what I'm supposed to do. To interview the applicant, ask him questions to see whether he's submitting sufficient evidence to overcome or not. I've, in my mind, I believe, but he's not giving me any evidence. He's not satisfying at all. What am I going to mention in the application? So this is, this is a, a problem that, again, we talked the last time about articulating, about how the people right. should answer the question, mm -hmm. depending on the situation. If you're going on a business trip, what kind of questions may be asked? If you're just going to go and attend the graduation party of your granddaughter, grandson, consul can say where? Which university? When did he pass? All the questions that come in the mind of the consul from that particular category, from right. that particular application. Right. So you have to be really fully, fully prepared. That's right. And Michael, uh, that officer with whom we spoke was actually very generous with his honest thoughts yeah. and concerns. Yes. And he uh, established, I think, at least in my mind, that the officers really are concerned about humanitarian claims. And uh, I believe that the specific issue that um, uh, that officer had addressed was that um, a woman had appeared in front of him uh, because she was going to a funeral, right. and um, he uh, he said no. He said I'm, I I can't grant the visa, and uh, he said that it really made him feel so badly that he had to leave his window and go and get a drink of water, and you know he felt so badly that he had to deny this this claim, but he had to do it because again he had to go by the book, and that was his set of rules. But uh, it, it helps us to understand that we're dealing with human beings who are trying to do their job, but it also helps us to understand how we can best guide our clients to be able to get favorable determinations when they go to those windows. Okay, let's also talk about some people who are denied and they want to reapply. A uh, word of advice is that if you have been denied once or twice and you keep on reapplying without proper explanation, you are just going to be wasting your money and time. Basically, the first question that the American Council, uh, the second application or a third reapplication is, why are you applying again? And they have clearly told me, told us that when somebody comes to reapply, we want to know what is that he has now that he did not have the last right. time. What, to, What's clearly, to clearly What's articulate yeah. Yeah. the change in the circumstances yeah. that allow for an approval after a denial. Correct. No, I remember, I mean, one right. case I remember the applicant went in and very honestly says, sir, 
I was absolutely not prepared last time. I didn't know uh, that you may want to see any documents or papers or something. At that time, they were looking at the papers also. So I'm very sorry you just came and I don't, and you, are, you made the right decision. It's my fault. I couldn't, didn't bring the papers. But now, this time, I have brought all the papers that, that were asked me. Right. So please, here they are. Now the council looks, that makes the council look at the papers, say, okay, so you have this time. Okay, fine. All right. So it's articulating. He articulated very nicely as to Clearly, why it was exactly. that. Never say the council made a wrong decision. He made a right decision because you are not fully prepared. Correct. You didn't bring the documents and you're Correct. sorry for that. And here is it in the, the reapplication based upon that. And of course, the changed circumstances, a person applied five years ago, he was single. Today right. he's married, he has two children. He's an industrialist. He's a businessman today. Seven years ago, he was a clerk in an office. So there's a big change in the circumstances which show that now he has compelling reasons to come back to his country after the visit. Right, and just going back to a point that you made, Michael, in the last program with regard to the documents, uh, the officers are clearly mindful of the fact that there could be potential fraud involved in the documents. And um, one of the gentlemen actually um, in one of our speaking engagements uh, for the uh, Indo-American Society over in India uh, had approached me and the consular officer was there and uh, he was saying, well, is it enough if I have a letter to say that my son is going to graduate? Well, that issue, the having a letter saying the son's going to graduate, we don't know whether that's a real letter or not. So one of the things that everyone agreed to is try to find some additional information that corroborates what's in that letter. For example, go on the website and print out uh, an agenda or a schedule of when the graduation is going to take place. Go, uh, go, you can certainly bring the letter. Maybe there's an invitation. Maybe there is some other, uh, uh, some other piece of evidence or document that you can bring that further corroborates what you're going to be doing, how long the, the visit's going to be, and what the individual's coming for. That's only if the officer wants to see any paper. Correct, the if paper. the officer asks for that <coughs> Then tell you a very interesting story. Long time ago, it's about 20 years ago, there was an applicant uh, who um, applied for a visa, visitor visa or a student visa, I don't recollect. The consul, consul said, I want to see some document. At that time, they were looking at the documents. The guy keep on asking the question, but give me some example, or tell me. Vice consul, I think, made a mistake in saying, okay, for example, you had a grandfather, and the grandfather had made the will that after my death, all my property goes to my grandson if he is living in India. He says, okay, sir. He goes out. He goes to the grandfather. Grandfather, grandfather, make a will. Why? Because the consul says, if you make a will like this, then I can get the visa. So then the grandfather goes with him to the court, have a lawyer. He prepares a will. And then the will is made the way the consul said. After three days, he goes and knocks the door. Say, Mr. Consul, I'm here again. Say, what, what's, what do you got? Oh, I have a will of my grandfather that now it says it, that I says. get the property so from the oh my yeah. god I just gave an example the guy went out and did it so right. this shows mm -hmm. that if you tell them we want x y and z documents they make them up and bring it right but that's not what the council wants to see he wants to see what you have already at the time of interview exactly so that's why the council officer will not say bring this or bring that it's for you to make a decision what kind of documents are in your possession that will satisfy the council I think we got to take a short break and right after the break we'll discuss further on this issue. Please stay tuned, we will be back. Welcome back. Uh, just before the break, we were talking about our trip to India, our various meetings with the American consuls and the valuable information we got from them that we had discussed in our last program as well as before the break. Now, w one thing that you mentioned is about the fraud. And, and this question comes, I think, from Chennai or New Delhi. But for the information purposes, I just want to tell you also, and probably you missed on talking about that, the, there is an officer in Chennai who is a program director for anti-fraud, the senior officer. And he or she actually coordinates with all other posts in India about fraud issues. And why I'm telling this? Because fraud is a big issue in India. 
and some other countries. Therefore, they have a special officer posted in India and also the, in the Department of State also there is an anti-fraud division which guides the uh, consular officer how they should conduct investigations, how they should find fraud and fraudulent documents. And that is one of the reasons that today, these days, any kind of application, consular officer is closely looking whether this person is telling the truth or these documents bona fide or not, is there any fraud or not. So, what would you advise the people? What is your suggestion uh, on the documentation or information that they? Well, that's a leading question, Michael, but the answer is, I know what Michael's looking for here, and that is, don't commit fraud. Don't do it. If you do it, you risk the potential to be barred from any and all immigration benefits in the future. And we said this at our speaking engagement in uh, Mumbai at the Indo-American Society. The uh, officer, uh, the consular officer who attended that meeting came up to us and said, oh, actually, no, he said it to the group. He said, um, these lawyers are giving you good advice. Do not commit fraud or you will be barred from any and all benefits in the future. Do it right. No, see, you, we know that there are a lot of cases that get stuck. And I'm not saying that they all have a committed a fraud or whatever. Because there are cases where the pers the American consul keeps a case pending, where it's a H1, with a H4, the spouse of a H4, or whatever the other case may be, mere suspicion sometimes. Or the consul thinks like that. Then well, he has to administrative keep that. administrative processing. Yeah, but then he has to, to then it. he cannot doesn't issue the visa because right. his suspicion is there, doubt is there, mm -hmm. or smell of the fraud comes from the papers. He says, okay, 221G admin processing. That means the consul may go further, verify certain documents, or do conduct a in field investigation, or maybe go on the website of the employer, or may go call an employer or the end customer on H1 kind of case to get some more information to see whether this person that I interviewed has given all the information correctly. Those cases sooner or later then get resolved in course of time once the counsel is satisfied. But if you are okay. fully prepared the first time, then you are not likely to get stuck and probably get the visa easily. Now just to move on a little bit, Michael, uh, so we discussed Chennai in our last program. So uh, just briefly to um, enlighten our, uh, uh, our viewers. We then went to New Delhi and we met at the consular complex, which is a beautiful complex in New Delhi. Um, and we met with uh, two of the consular officers there, the uh, head of the, uh, the consular section. section, the visa section. And, and the chief of um, visas. And the chief way. of the visa, yes. We, we, so we met with uh, two individuals there. And then after that, we went and met with the um, individuals who are responsible for the USCIS office, which is right next door in the, um, uh, in the complex. And there we discussed issues about waivers and um, the uh, streamlining of the waiver process. And uh, we tried to get some views from the officers about the new provisional uh, waiver uh, rules. And they were very helpful in helping us to understand how day to day they do their operations in that office and deal with issues such as waivers. And um, Let, let's talk about. Uh uh, in Delhi, or maybe that, that happens in other posts also, where H-4 applicant goes, so wife or children of the H-1 in U.S., and the consul holds up the case 221G. Now, I recall uh, one of the consul officers in a post said that I only look at the qualifying relationship between the beneficiary, principal beneficiary, and the family member. That's correct. So if they, the, the H1 person is working in the US, the wife and children are coming, he wants to make sure that wife and children are really the family members. That's right. But there are other, another consular officer said, but in, in his situation, if he sees that there's- In his opinion. In opinion. Right. If he sees that the principal beneficiary H1 has committed fraud or there's a material misrepresentation. Or there's some issue of fraud with regard to the employer, then, then that H-1 may not be valid, yeah. which then affects the H-4, yeah. which gives him the right to question the relationship. Exactly. Right. But he's, he, he very honestly said those kind of cases are very, very, very few, not too many cases. Although, That's I right. mean, basically, the, one of the questions we asked, I think, in one of the consul posts, why you so many cases you keep pending 221G and admin processing? Right. 
consular officer says, what do you think is the number? I say 40 percent, 50 percent. He says, you are wrong. I say 20 percent, wrong. 30 percent, 10 percent. He says, less than 10 percent. He says, because your clients are coming to you, those who are in trouble, those who are cases are denied, you do not see the clients to whom we give actually. So, he says, 90 percent are the people that get the visas without a problem. Right. It is only less than 10 percent that get in trouble and those, those like are the a, ones that we hear doctor. from. Yeah. It is like a medical doctor, he is only seeing all day sick patients, but not the millions of healthy patients who do not come to the doctor's office. Right. So, doctors are looking all the time only on the sick patients. So, you and me all the time, most of the time we look at people the who have the sick problems patients. with the immigration right. benefits or need right. assistance in the immigration. Benefits. I think this is a good time also, Michael. Let us help our viewers. Uh, probably many of them are aware of VFS and how VFS works. Let us talk a little bit about VFS and how the consuls are using VFS and uh, whether it is uh, a good thing, is it a bad thing, how is it working? Well, first of all, VFS is not a part of the U.S. government. That's correct. It's, it's an outsourced uh, organization. Outsourcing contractor. Correct. And uh, that's something that they started to ease the burden upon the consular right. post. It's another topic to. I think we need to. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to take a break. But yes. when we come back from the break, maybe we can just address VFS and how the process interfaces with the U.S. consulate. So let's take a short break, and after, right after the break, we'll continue this discussion further. Welcome back. Just before the break, we were talking about our visit to India, the American consulates in New Delhi, Chennai and Mumbai. And uh, we came to a point where the question about VFS came into existence. A lot of people were complaining or complaining still that uh, there is a confusion there and uh, they do not have a proper guidance and for what services they should go to VFS or what services they go to the American consulate. What is the role that a VFS plays, uh, plays, uh, plays in the visa processing? Now, let me just go back a uh, few years back, many years back. There was no such thing as a VFS. The entire visa processing was done by the American consulates. The, all the documents, whenever were needed, you had to go and apply for a visa. And paperwork was there. There are no online things. And at that time, they were scheduled for interview at the window. And the process, they will stamp the passport. They will give it back on the same day. Very easy, very simple, very straightforward. As the time went by, the work increased and the government wanted to be a little easier on the consular work officer workload. So, they came with a plan to hire an outsourcing company, which is in India's VFS, Visa Facilitation Service. And there were some other agency, different places, but later on, it's VFS at all the places in India. And, and then they had a process that, okay, their submission of the application, documents, papers, let VFS, which is the outsourcing company, not a part of the uh, government agency or the immigration service or the consulates, that they go to the VFS office, submit the documentation, and they will then send it to the consulate. And slowly, slowly, the responsibilities of VFS kept on increasing. It's still okay because end of the day, the interview was done by the consular officers and if we had any questions, we used to send an email to the consulate, not to the VFS and they will respond to our inquiry very quickly. So, still some people were unhappy, but I would say to some extent, the consular officer reduced their workload. So, they were able to then spend more time on interviews and processing the case than just collecting the papers and the documents, fine. The recently things that have changed now is that when you send an inquiry about your case to American consulate in Bombay, you are really not supposed to do that. You are supposed to send to VFS. Not only that, they say most of the inquiries, the congressmen, the senators and even lawyers, the inquiries that they make, they have to go to New Delhi. And I would say that even we thought that in my opinion, we thought, okay, so it is a consular officer in New Delhi rather than Mumbai. So at least maybe a senior consular officer is looking at the case and will respond. We found out during our meetings with the consular officer, we found out that was not so. 
because the consular officers were not directly responding. The inquiry goes to VFS and they are supposed to be responding. And we have found in many cases they have no knowledge about the case. They don't know. They send a template kind of computerized response. A script. A script. You they're, can they're, see. Yeah, they're scripting responses. And that doesn't answer yeah. our question. So yeah. we did discuss about that yeah. with the consular officers. I would say almost all the posts, and they said that is a decision made, and then we have to follow that decision, and unless there's a change place to take place from the Department of State or who. Right now right. we don't even know at this time really, David whether it is coming from the Department of State or whether the local policy, but we are going to definitely look into that issue. Right. We're, we're seeking to address, I guess, the disconnect which we feel might be happening between VFS and the consular office. And just by way of an example, something that recently happened, we sent a request regarding one of our cases to the, uh, to the consulate directly, to which the consulate responded. And then when we sent the same uh, request, to VFS, we got a response from them saying that they had uh, no record of the case at all having been filed at the consulate. And that's a big problem and it's very troubling to us because obviously VFS is supposed to be online and on the same page as the consulate. So that's a bit of a problem. We are going to see what happens because as you know, even the senators, congressmen, they used to send uh, inquiry to the concerned post which has the file, which did the interview, which knows all the facts. So at least there was some reasonable response, although as you and I know that most of the time the council officer, they are also have a ten place, thank you very much for inquiry, and this case is still under process, and we will advise you when a decision is done, right. or, or the, we denied the case because uh, there was no qualifying relationship between the petition and the beneficiary. And most of the time it was a ten plate kind of, but it's still the response was coming in some cases. Some cases they did take action also, but now it has changed. The policy now is that all inquiries go to the American Embassy in New Delhi, and the New Delhi office, I, I believe, is not a, those cases don't go to VFS that are responded directly by the consular officer who's in charge for the communications and the correspondence. Right. Well, he said, and he said that he is working very closely with VFS. Yeah. VFS answers most of the questions if they can. And then anything that needs to be escalated gets escalated to See, him. That's, and that's, then he that's where the I question. have a problem. That's where VFS they answer anything that they do. Only they see if they see they cannot answer a question, then they go to the consulate to that's discuss right. or to get a correct. So those cases end up getting a, at least a good right response. Correct. But then again, the initial screening is done by VFS. So if they decide to answer on their own, and the answer doesn't make any sense. They're still pending, it's still pending, it's still pending because they are looking at the computer. Right. They are responding from the computer which says case is pending. But that's right. not what we want to know. We want to know from the council why is it pending, what is the story, like how can we help, right. is there any additional documents required and all that. Exactly, or please make a decision so we can advance the case for our clients and move things along. Right. So hopefully I think in the future at some point that I had some feeling that some of the consular officers themselves were not very happy with, uh, with the system, but it's hard to say. And some of, the office, some of them were really very happy that they, they, they don't have the burden of uh, responding well, directly. I, I got the feeling that the officers clearly were happy that their phones were not ringing off the hook and that VFS was acting as a buffer. And my guess is, at least from a business perspective, that there probably is a tremendous amount of attrition that happens by virtue of the response by VFS and that people will uh, not continue to persist because they've heard from VFS and they're not going to keep coming back to the consulate. And so some people will uh, slow down in their uh, ability to uh, be persistent about getting responses. And that's not really so good because it, what ends up happening is things fall between the cracks and we don't get answers. See, uh, <coughs> David. I see a problem where a lot of public, everybody that has a case pending will send every day an email, every day they, you know, just unload hundreds or thousands of emails every day, which right. is what probably the consular officer found is going to be very difficult to deal to with. To deal it. with, exactly. Now, I think, I think there may be make some sense in that, but so far the attorney inquiries are concerned, for example, attorneys are more uh, articulated, their inquiry is more specific to the point 
asking the address in the question. That's right. And that, that's what we are trying to do. They are trying to go through our association. We are trying to get uh, some change done, convince the consular officer they could probably, hopefully, at some point agree to have a separate uh, email address for the attorneys uh, that okay. could be handled by the even the New Delhi Embassy is fine. I think we are coming to the end of the program. We hope that our last program as well as this program on our trip to India and meetings with the American consular officers was very helpful to you uh, from the information that we provide about that. David, thank you very much for thank coming you, on Michael. the program. Thanks and thank so all much. of you for watching the program. Please keep watching us every Saturday at 1 p.m. Thank you.